theme for this morning is called Kingdom Giving. And uh, the Lord dropped this in my spirit while I was, well, on vacation, on recovering, coming from under sedation and taking pain medication, okay? But I could still hear the voice of the Holy Spirit because as a uh, prophetic house, as an apostolic house, we know how important kingdom is. I want to talk a little bit about the kingdom of God today because it's so significant in understanding how we interpret scripture. There's a lot that's going on in kingdom or Christendom right now. Not kingdom, but Christendom. Christendom has to do with anything that says or looks or uh, talks as though they're representing Christianity. There's so many different kinds of Christianity going on. I can't keep up with them. But when your kingdom, kingdom is what makes a difference when you get a revelation of the kingdom, okay? The kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven. Those terms have a parallel usage throughout the gospels. It's very important. But we understand what the kingdom of God is. Jesus came preaching the kingdom. Turn to Matthew chapter 4, verse 23. Jesus came preaching the kingdom. John the Baptist came preaching the kingdom. When Jesus taught, the people recognized that he taught as one having authority, as one having authority because he, thought, he taught the principles of the kingdom while keeping the law as a prophet under the old covenant. And in verse 23, it says here in Matthew, and Jesus went about all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom. Everybody say the gospel of the kingdom. The gospel of the kingdom and healing all manner of sickness and all manner of disease among the people. So Jesus went about preaching the kingdom, the gospel of the kingdom. And so the gospel of the kingdom is so very important that we understand. We need to understand the church. We understand the body of Christ. We need to understand Israel. But we need to understand the kingdom of God, which is superior to all of it. And it is an understanding that we have that God is king, that Christ is king over the spiritual realm, over all dimensions, over every person, over the universe, that he rules and reigns. So the kingdom is the rule and reign and sovereignty of almighty God. It is the fulfillment of the will of God being done here on earth. It has to do with righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. The Bible was very clear and succinct when Jesus said, except you be born again, you cannot see or understand the kingdom. You cannot see or understand the kingdom. The people came to Jesus at one time, and they asked Jesus, show us the kingdom. He said, the kingdom of God does not come with observation, but the kingdom of God is within you. So every last one of us, the kingdom is within us, and that's very important. The main content of God's kingdom and preaching the gospel of the kingdom has to do with the will of God. The process, purpose, prophecy, the course of events, history, and all that, all of which God is sovereign over. And it's our, our, our responsibility to see to it that we are set apart unto the kingdom to do his will. The kingdom of the spirit of grace is against the law of sin and the tyranny of the devil and all this other stuff. Jesus says, behold, I give unto you the keys of the kingdom. And that is authority. So whatever you bind on earth is bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth is loosed in heaven. And so we are here on this planet to advance God's kingdom by revelation and understanding, but also that God and Christ might be glorified in our lives. It's very important. And so for you and me as worshipers, as we just ministered the song, and that song came out for our first album with Harmony and Sony, uh, thank you, thank you, Lord. I love, love, love that song. But recognizing that Jesus' all power has been given unto him. So we talk about the power of the kingdom. 
We talk about the worship of the kingdom. We, 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 we understand kingdom, that the kingdom has a king. Jesus said a kingdom divided against itself cannot stand. And he talked about a house divided against itself cannot stand. And it's important that we understand that when you come before the king, there's a certain way that you approach the king. And as a matter of fact, uh, 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 God told the people of Israel, you do not come before the king empty. That means you bring gifts unto the king. You do not come. I'm talking about practical things that we must understand and transfer to the spiritual realm so we'll understand what dimension we're really operating in. We're operating as children of God in a dimension that is not normal and not natural because it has to do with things we cannot see, but it has to do with faith. It has to do with the faith of God's kingdom. What we have to look at and consider now is what I call ordered chaos. Because the kingdom of God, the church, the body of Christ must be united. And if we cannot come together in the area of giving, if we cannot get in agreement in the area of giving, that's a sad day. My father and your father, my savior and your savior, we do not box with one another. We do not fight one another. But there's some things that are so doctrinally sound that we have to get to the word of God and go into the Bible and see what the scriptures say so we can walk in that. See, ordered chaos is a complex situation or process that appears chaotic, but it has enough order to achieve whatever their, their, their pro progress is, okay? And I'm talking about how stuff infiltrates into the body of Christ and it's chaotic. It brings confusion. God is not the author of confusion, but of peace. And so systems and incidents that appear random states of disorder, but are actually governed by underlying goals, and I would say the underlying goals of the adversary. During the weekend of July 4th, July 4th weekend, a lot happened during that weekend. We had mass and violent shootings, more than one, all over the place. We had the uh, overturn of Roe versus Wade. We, we saw the explosion of the Georgia Guidestones. Uh, and then we come to this point where we begin to argue and divide over tithing. So let's talk about the kingdom of God. Let's talk about God's law and God's word, how it affects us today. Let's talk about your anticipation of the acceleration <laughs> of the manifestation for the demonstration of God's will in your life and in my life. It's important. See, the Bible tells us that we have a kingdom that cannot be moved. That cannot be moved. So Jesus preaching the kingdom, and when the disciples came to Jesus and said, Master, teach us to pray, as John also taught his disciples to pray. And Jesus said, after this manner, pray ye, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. When you understand the covenants of God and the dispensations of God, you will understand that there is and always has been, as been taught through the prophets and the old covenant and Jesus and even the Pauline epistles about the everlasting kingdom. We are part of the everlasting kingdom. As a matter of fact, all the way to the book of the Revelation, God is referred to as the king of saints, and that is us. All of us are called to be saints. We're the saints of God. And so we begin to look at what God is saying to us about the kingdom. In Exodus 19, why don't you turn there with me? Exodus 19 is very important. In Exodus 19, I've always taught this. I love teaching this because... Let's look at verse, uh, let's go to verse 6, I think it is. Okay. Look at verse 4. 
It says, you have seen, Exodus 19, 4. You have seen what I did unto the Egyptians and how I bare you on eagles' wings and brought you unto myself. Now, therefore, if you will obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant, then you shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people, for all the earth is mine. And you shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words which thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel. Now, this is very, very important. He said, keep my covenant. You shall be a peculiar treasure above all the people. You should be a kingdom of priests. It has always been God's uh, 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 projection of his vision for his earth family to be a kingdom of priests. That is very significant. We are a priestly kingdom. And so therefore, you and I in Christ are part of the royal priesthood. We are a holy nation. We are peculiar people, as Peter tells us. But Peter is saying by unction of the Holy Ghost, what was already decreed and declared in the book of Exodus when God let the children of Israel out. So always, always we were to be a kingdom of priests. We are a priestly kingdom. And understanding that, the Bible says that we are lively stones or living stones, that we are built up a spiritual house, okay, that we're to offer up spiritual sacrifices, that we're a chosen generation, that we are a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar treasure or peculiar people, and that we're peculiar means God's possession. We've been sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. We are God's possession. Now, the thing that is so important about this in 2022 is that in the 15th century, around thereabouts, Martin Luther uh, began what is known as the Protestant Reformation. The Protestant Reformation was just that, a protest against uh, the Roman Catholic Church or the Roman Catholic authority of the papacy, in other words. And so what Martin Luther did was he nailed his 95 Thesis on the Wittenberg Church because he wanted to have a conversation with the Pope because he was not in agreement with the way things were going. And when we begin to look at the book of Acts all the way to maybe the 14th hundred or, the, or 15th century, the church as we know it had changed dramatically from an apostolic church built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets to the church of Rome run by the Pope and the papacy, little or no attention being given to our Jewish roots and the change of the infrastructure that God had built into the kingdom for the church and the body of Christ. Completely changed, okay? And so one of the things Martin Luther wanted to, to, to make sure that we understood, and that was two things, even though there were 95 points, but there were two in particular, and that was justification by faith and the priesthood of believers. Now, it's amazing to me that we still don't teach the priesthood of believers. That means that every believer is part of that priesthood, not just men, but all of us are part of that priesthood. And that because we're part of that priesthood, that's why we can be told to come boldly unto the throne of grace. That's why we can go within the veil. That's why the blood of Jesus has consecrated for us a new and living way that we can enter into the holiest of all. Turn to the book of the Revelation, chapter 1. Revelation, chapter 1. I'm going to look at verse 5. And six. Revelation 1, verse 5 and 6. And from Jesus, who is the faithful witness, and the first begotten of the dead, and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins, in his own blood, in his own blood, in his own blood, and hath made us kings and priests 
unto God and his Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. And so he washed us by his own blood and made us kings and priests. So understand that what I'm going to teach today, you will not get it if you do not understand and accept that the priesthood has changed. If you do not understand that the body of Christ is part of the royal priesthood. In fact, the writer of the book of Hebrews uh, made uh, an astounding kind of like indictment against the people of God. Go to Hebrews chapter 5. When he says at one time that you are in need, that someone teach you again, which, be, which are the first oracles of the doctrine of Christ, okay? In Hebrews chapter 5. In Hebrews chapter 5, look at verse 10. Verse 8. Though he were a son, yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered. That's Christ. We're not going to get past suffering, you guys. And being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation to all them that obey him. Called of God and high priest after the order of Melchizedek, of whom we have many things to say and hard to be uttered, seeing you are dull of hearing. So the writer of Hebrews goes on to talk to the people in verse 12 and says, For when, for the time you ought to be teachers, you have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God, and have become such as have need of milk and not strong meat. This was particularly because they did not understand that called of God and a high priest after the order of Melchizedek. Not understanding that Melchizedek uh, as many think, were or could have been the pre-incarnate Christ, okay, the appearance of Christ in the Old Testament. But I have a reason why I don't particularly embrace that, but you can if you want to. King of peace and, and king of righteousness. Remember, Jesus is the only one that's prophet, priest, and king. And so these people here, he said, I need to teach you again these things that you'll know. In the first, second, and third century, of the church after the book of Acts, we began to find some things that were happening in the Roman church. And largely the Roman church began to uh, not feel that the law of God or the Old Testament was relevant. They didn't believe in the Old Testament laws, okay, or any view which rejects the law or any type of legalism other than what the Pope declared, because the Pope was considered infallible. Infallible means that he could change the Bible that whatever he said goes, whatever he says was true, okay? And so when you begin to understand the gospel and the different dispensation that God has taken us through, you will understand this, that the church is not under the Mosaic law. The church is not under the Mosaic law, okay? We're not. However, we must understand that everything that was written in the law was written for our admonition, it's an example that we might learn. And what were we to learn? That the law was a shadow. Turn to Hebrews 10 for just a moment. The law was a shadow. Hebrews 10, verse 1. For the law having a shadow of good things to come. Look at the words to come. It was a shadow of the good things to come. The good things to come... It's what we're living in now, and that is God's grace. For the law having a shadow of good things to come, and not the very image of the things, can never with those sacrifices which they offered year by year continually make the comers there into perfect. For then would they not have ceased to be offered, because that the worshipers once purged should have had no more conscience of sin. But in those sacrifices, there is a remembrance again made of sins every year. For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats should take away sins. So the law, the Bible says, was our schoolmaster to bring us to faith. James, find that scripture for me. It was a schoolmaster to bring us to faith. It was to teach us things. 
What was the law to teach us? Well, first of all, it was to teach us that by the giving of the law was the knowledge of sin, so man would know what sin was. But the law was also a shadow and a pattern. It was a figure. It was a figure in the tabernacle, uh, the tent pitched in the wilderness. It was a figure even of the temple. As glorious as Solomon's temple was, it was still a figure. We have to understand that in the word of God, there are types and there are symbols. There are things that God uses prophetically and, and, and things that we have to understand comparing scripture with scripture. So by giving of the laws of knowledge of sin, Paul writes that to the church of Rome in chapter 7. But we have to understand the historical significance of the law. Even though the church is not under the Mosaic law, there is a historical significance to the law. It taught us how to approach God. It taught us how to honor God. It taught us how to respect God, how to worship. It taught us about the priesthood. We needed to understand about the priesthood. And let me put a little point here. See, every religion has a priesthood. Voodoo, witches, wizards, there's always a priesthood, some type of priesthood. The kingdom of God has a priesthood. But the kingdom of God, our priesthood, is patterned now after Christ because the priesthood changed. And now, what is the present-day ministry of Jesus Christ? What is his ministry to us today now that he's ascended and sitting high above all the heavens? What is his ministry to us today? His ministry to us today is high priest. Jesus is our high priest. He ever lives to make intercession for us. And so what did the Lord teach us? Offerings sacrifices. Do not. Don't do this. Don't do that. In fact, the Bible tells us that it was impossible for anyone to keep the law. The only person that fulfilled the law was Christ. He said, I didn't come to destroy the law and the prophets. I came to what? Fulfill. So he came to fulfill the law. So what do we learn from the law? The moral laws, dietary law, ceremonial laws, things that are written for our admonition. It is very important that we understand these. Why? Because the law is burst upon human effort. The law is external. It's not internal. The law could not justify us. Because we're justified by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. We are justified or found not guilty or declared righteous by faith, by the blood of Jesus. The law could not sanctify us. We are only sanctified by the body and the blood of Jesus Christ. The law could not consecrate us. The law could not do these things. Okay, it's very important we understand the law could not take away sin. It could cover it, but it couldn't take it away, and it only covered it for a year. The law could not say, I've taken your sins, and I've thrown them into the sea of forgetfulness forever. The law could not say that. And so we had to understand. And so Jesus brought us this truth. The Bible tells us in John chapter 1, the Gospel of John, that grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. So we approach God because of his grace, because of his mercy, not by anything that we've done, but what Christ did for us, that salvation is by grace. And so not being under the law, go to Romans 8, chapter 2. Eight, Romans 8, verse 2. Romans 8, verse 2. I'm going to try to get through this, most of it, and if I have to pick up next week, then I get it. But the bulk of it, I want to get to you today. I was online looking at something, and there was a conversation going on between people about the recent, recent statements that were made by Creflo Dollar. And uh, people were arguing back and forth. I don't get in arguments. I don't do that online. I don't do that, okay? But these people talking well, says, well, has anybody heard what Bam Crawford has to say about it? <laughs> <laughs> so I said, Lord, hey, has anybody heard? And I don't feel like that I'm the master teacher or anything like that. 
I'm still growing. I'm still learning. Like he said, he's still growing. He's still learning. But I felt that I have a responsibility to my congregation, to our friends, to the networks that I'm over, to the nations, to share the word of God, the gospel of the kingdom in regards to relationship and giving because it's very significant, okay? So look at Romans 8, chapter, chapter 8. Look at verse 2. Okay. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. We're not under the law, okay? For what? Listen to this. For what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin condemned sin in the flesh. Verse 4 is key as well. That the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. Now, this is so important because we walk after the spirit, not after the flesh. So the law could not make anyone perfect. The law could not take away sins. But the law was a schoolmaster. It taught us things. I think the problem that a lot of people have is they're not willing to really study the law or study the Old Testament. But we have a tendency to go through the Bible and pick out the things we want to fit our doctrine or to fit what we want. Okay, and we have to stop doing that. The Bible tells us in the book of Galatians is that no man is justified by the law, for the just shall live by faith. No man is justified by the law, the just shall live by faith. So since Jesus fulfilled the law, okay, it's important that we understand that by the deeds of the law, no man is justified. So God has given all of us grace, the gift of grace, the free gift of grace, God's generous redemption. God's love, God's undeserved kindness for you and for me to empower us. Grace is the empowering ability of Almighty God that gives us everything we need in life to fulfill purpose, to advance the kingdom of God. Grace alone, the gospel alone, faith alone, and Christ alone. The cross is the power of God. And a lot of people don't want to teach the cross. The cross is the power of God. And so through Christ, the authority and power and wisdom and enablement is inclusive of everything, your purpose and my purpose. Why is kingdom giving so important? It's important that we understand that because it's being misrepresented. It's being misrepresented by people that I would consider hirelings. Hirelings are not true shepherds under Christ. As a shepherd, we are God's under shepherds. All of us pastors, we are under shepherds. We need to understand our position, our place, and stay in it. Christ is the good shepherd. Okay? He is the good shepherd. So it's important that we understand because he is the good shepherd. Go to John chapter 10. John chapter 10. Christ is the good shepherd. But he did say that there are hirelings. Hirelings are those who do not, listen to me now, and get mad at me, whatever. Just get ready, get ready, get ready, get mad. Okay, get ready, okay. Because it says here, Jesus says in verse 11, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. But he that is an hireling and not the shepherd whose own the sheep are not, seeth the wolf coming, and leave the sheep, and fleeth, and the wolf catches them, and scatters the sheep. The hireling fleeth, because he is a hireling, and cared not for the sheep. Jesus said, I am the good shepherd, and know my sheep, and am known of mine. As the Father knows me, even so Know I the Father, and I lay my life for the sheep. And other sheep I have, which are not of this fold. So Jesus is saying that he is the sheep. He, excuse me, I take that back. That we are the sheep, and he is the shepherd. Jesus makes a statement in Matthew 22. Why don't you turn there for a moment, too? I'm not going to be able to go to all these scriptures and get to where I want to get to today. 
So I'm talking to myself because I'd like for you to see it in the Bible. So me and Kay may have to put together a scripture list for you so you can study this on your own. You need to know this. So when somebody comes and says stuff on the Internet, you'll know where to stand. Okay. Look at verse, I think I want to go to verse 29. Oh, here it is. Yes. Okay. Uh, it says here, verse 29, Jesus answered and said unto them, You do error, not knowing the scriptures, nor the power of God. So where does error come from? Error comes from not knowing the scriptures. You may know your pet promises and your pet verses and your denomination, but you don't know the scriptures. When I talk about the scriptures, I'm talking about from Genesis to the Revelation. Not just what they told me when I got saved. Start reading in Romans because that's where all your promises are. That's where you, you're going to learn who you are in Christ. I've learned more about God or just as much about God as being a student of the Old Testament. In our school, I teach Old Testament survey. I teach uh, uh, Bible uh, history. So here we got to understand that you do not know the scriptures and you don't know the power of God. You error. So there's error going on. What is the error? The error going on is, is by saying that tithing is not biblical. That's the first error. Saying tithing is not biblical. That is not true. Tithing is biblical. It is biblical. Okay? We need to understand that. We need to understand also that tithing is a biblical principle. And it is a channel of blessing. And it's something that God, remember things are written for our admonition, that God revealed to us in Genesis 14 when Abraham paid tithes to Melchizedek. Abraham paid tithes to Melchizedek. It's very important that we understand that. Jacob made a vow to God. He said, if you would put a roof over my head and clothes on my back and give me food to eat, then I vow to give you a tenth of all. That was Jacob. In the book of Genesis 28, before the law. In Genesis 31, the same Jacob who had been robbed of his wages by Laban, God gave him a dream. And in that dream, God gave him the plan for prosperity. And the plan was for prosperity was how the animals would conceive by the water. And God reminded Jacob, he said, I've come because of the vow that you made from, to me. And so keeping the vow you made to God, there is no law under the new covenant that says you have to tithe. There is no law or mandate that says you have to tithe. Why? Because we're under the commandment of love. And you give because you love God. I don't give and tithe because I have to. I give and tithe because I want to. And so while people are arguing about, you don't have to tithe, you don't have to tithe, many times those are people who are not giving anyhow. And you may get pissed off at me, but just get pissed enough to get in the scriptures and look for yourself. Because, listen, the hireling, I'm telling you, grace does not use tithing as a weapon. Grace does not pervert the truth. Grace does not threaten people or threaten to shoot non-tithers. Grace does not make people feel guilty or condemned or manipulate. Get, grace does not have people giving under duress. Grace does not shear the sheep with four offerings in one service. Grace does not raise offerings and con people and promise them stuff that you say God said that he never said with your false prophesying self. Grace does not pay for prophecies. Grace does not promise prosperity through someone receiving an offering. You are an heir of God and joint heir with Jesus Christ. It can't get no better than that. Ain't no way you're going to talk me into giving something that is better than what God has already done. Come on now, somebody. you got to help me now. You don't want me to get up. I can't get up on this leg. You're going to make me feel like I want to get up and run in this place. 
You give because you want to give. You give because you love God. You give because God's been good to you. That's why you give. You don't give to get. God ain't no, no pimp. You know, he ain't no panderer. You don't do that. Grace does not make the sheep or the saints or the priests feel unworthy or inferior. Grace is not a kind artist. Some of you may not have known, and you may be operating in tradition or your denomination or your ministry, and you have given, you have given, you have given toward your pastors like myself. You've given toward your pastor's anniversary, your pastor's house, your pastor's car, your pastor's prayer tower, and your pastor's airplane, whatever. That's on you. Giving is between you and God. It's between you and God. And we have an example of Jesus sitting in the temple when they were giving. And remember when the little widow, she came in and she gave her two mites. And in giving her two mites, people might have said, that's not enough. But Jesus said, she's given more than you all because she gave everything. See, God is fair. And even when I get in the Old Testament teaching, which I'm not going to get there today, even when I get there, you'll see that even with the tithe to the priests and the tithe of the tithe and the heave offering and all these other areas of giving and the penalty associated with giving, you're not under that anymore. However, but as a biblical principle, you can still give what you want to give. But first of all, you got to have a willing heart and a willing mind. you got to be a worshiper and understand who Jesus is and understand that you're part of the kingdom and that Jesus is a king. And by his blood, he's also made you a king and a priest. I heard a pastor tell people that in this offering, you will elevate your altar higher than your enemies. Junk. I rebuke that in the name of Jesus. You don't get no higher than higher than the heavens. You don't get no higher than the name of Jesus. You don't get no stronger than God Almighty. And so conning people, why do you feel like you got to have an altar higher than your enemy when you got the name of Jesus that's above every name? See, God's word is true. And when we understand dispensations, we understand the law of first mention that God told us in Genesis 14 about paying tithes. My goodness gracious, I remember Dr. Haygood wrote a book years ago, uh, 25, 30, 40 years ago, called Why the Tithe? And the tithe means the top most of the best. So God wants you to give your best. Give what you can. Even under the law, those that didn't have it to give, God made an allowance for them, for the poor or the people who just did not have it. He didn't beat them over the head and threaten to shoot them and all that kind of stuff. He did not do that. He allowed them to bring in, bring a pigeon or bring something that was affordable, something they could do. He also provided an offering for ignorance. God is truly truly our father and if you understand what he put in the law you'll understand that where we are now we have a covenant on better promises better promises better covenant it's all voluntary contribution it's voluntary what you want to give say well you say that people ain't gonna give i read someplace online this week somebody said well the black church is gonna go bankrupt well yeah hearty heart heart god thanks a lot for your confidence in the people of god See, the people who truly give, we will give if we can't write it off on our taxes. No, you didn't hear what I said. I said we will give if we can't write it off on our taxes because we know that we know that we know who we are in God, okay? So is tithing required or mandated? No. But because we're under the law of love, I do it. I give. I tithe because I love the Lord. Do I have to? No. So you're going to stop me? Who's big enough? Who gonna check me, boo? I'm a give. Now you can do what you want, but I'm a give. And I'm gonna keep giving. 
And I don't care about Creflo, flow, who flow, they flow, you flow. Flow on. I'm going to give. This is a biblical practice that precedes the law, exists during the law, and exists on its own apart from the law. It's an act of worship and recognition. It's an act of gratitude for the blessings that God has bestowed upon us. It's from everlasting to everlasting to everlasting. It has supported the ministry of the Levites and the priests in the Old Covenant, and it supports ministry today. I know people have misused it. I know that you're turned off. I know that pastors, their hirelings are pastors who have done wrong by the tithe and done wrong by offerings, and you're so tired and frustrated with the gains, and I am too, and I am too, and I understand. But I do know that God said he will rebuke the devourer, okay? Now, you'd have to go to Malachi chapter 1, okay? And then go to Malachi chapter 1. And you're going to have to stick with me a little bit today because I'm going to get as far as I can. Are y'all willing to stick with me today? You should be. I ain't been here for three weeks, so just whatever. Okay. I'm just going to take advantage of it, okay? Go to Malachi chapter 1. I'm not going to read all of Malachi. That's your homework assignment. But I want you to do this, okay? In verse 6, Malachi 1, 6, I did a teaching. And the teaching says, if I'm your father, where is my honor? Okay. So verse 6, underline, where is my honor? In verse 7, circle the word offer. In verse 8, circle the word offer. In verse 10, circle the word offering. In verse 11, circle the word offered and circle the words pure offering. In verse 13, circle the word offering. Verse 14, underline, cursed be the deceiver. Come on, somebody. Now, what I want you to do and understand, that before you can go to Malachi 3 and say, will a man rob God? Oh, how have we robbed thee in tithes and offerings? you got to read Malachi chapter 1. And you got to understand what the prophet is talking about here and why he had this burden and assignment to rebuke the priest of God, the priest of Israel. Why? Because they allowed people to give unacceptable offerings. They allowed the people to give molded bread and blind animals and lame animals. The offerings that they allowed the people to bring were not acceptable. That is what this book is all about. So will a man rob God? So they said, we ever, we've been receiving tithe. No, but the tithe you've been receiving has not been pure. So yeah, we have to talk about giving. We have to talk about giving without feeling guilty. But this is all about, this here is all about how you gave, the manner in which the people gave, and what have you. Are you still with me? Okay, so I need you to understand the preeminence of Christ. I need you to understand how God feels about the poor. That one of the things he taught the children of Israel was how to take care of the poor, how to leave enough for the poor. And if you understand about the poor, you will recognize that in this country alone, how many poor people we have in this country? I think I have it written here someplace. In this country, we have so many poor people. In the United States, 10.5%, that's 34 million people, live below the, the what you may call the poverty level. World Vision said about 9.2% of the world, or 689 million people live in extreme poverty on less than $1.90 a day, according to the World Bank. Now, let me talk to you. What you complaining about? If you did have to tithe, you still got 90% to be a steward over if you did. I'm not saying that you have to, but, I'm not, but I am saying, why not? 
I learned about kingdom giving, and I learned about the laws of increase, and I learned that seed time and harvest is going to be here with us till earth pass away. Seed time and harvest. I learned that if you cast your bread upon the waters, after many days it's going to come to you again. I've learned that you come together, according to 1 Corinthians chapter 16, and you, you come and you bring Sunday, the first day of the week, as God has prospered you. God is a giver. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believe in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. He is the supreme giver. You cannot be God-giving. But you don't have to give to God for him to do something for you. God already did it for you. You've already been blessed with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places. He's already given to you all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who's called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. He's already given us grace and peace multiplied. Grace and peace multiplied. He's given us the gift of grace and the gift of righteousness. You can't buy those things. You can't pay for those things. You can only show your appreciation and gratitude. And that little offering that you and I have and what we give, it's not even compared. It can't even be compared to what God has given us. Remember, that the, the law was a shadow. Now, let me talk about the preeminence of Christ before I close. Go to Hebrews 7. In Hebrews chapter 7. You guys can keep arguing if you want to. I'm done. I was done a long time ago. And I remember the first time I heard God speak to me audibly was in the area of giving. And I was at the other church, and I was walking down the center aisle because we used to bring our tithes to the front of the church. And really, I was bringing my tithe to the front of the church because I didn't want to be considered a non-tither. It was nothing but pride and ego. And I'm walking up to the front of the church to give my offering with my I'm up in my hand with my high heels. I've just got one foot in the church, one foot in the world, still a fornicator, straight up tripping. But I don't I want to be considered whoever in the church. And as I was walking down that aisle with those thoughts going through my mind, shoot, I need some tires, shoot. I need to get my car fixed. Shoot. I got that layaway downtown. Shoot. Oh the shoot. All these thoughts. And I'm telling you, I didn't say it out loud. But if I ever heard God's voice audibly in my life, he said, keep it. I don't want it. And that's what he's saying to you today. Keep it. I don't want it. If you can't give cheerfully, if you can't give hilariously, God said, keep it. I don't want it. If you don't understand that giving is a channel through which God blesses you, blesses you, whether it's an offering or a tithe, I can tithe 10%. I can give 20%. People have given 30%. There are people living off of 10% and giving 90%. Some of you guys are missing it because you don't understand. It's more blessed to give than to receive. Not because you have to, but because you have your Father's heart. Because you understand your Father's love. Go to Hebrews chapter 7. Now, I'm going to talk about the preeminence of Christ. I'm going to talk about how this priesthood has changed and why it's so important. Hallelujah. Now, if somebody knew back on the board there, and I'm thankful for you being here, so I'm going over, so you'll know I'm going over just a little bit, okay? You know, all grown up now, grown man. Okay, started off in our children's ministry. I'm so proud of you. That's what God does. He'll raise you up in the church. Set your feet on solid ground. Give you a career and a vocation where you get paid big money. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Look at Hebrews chapter 7. That in all things Jesus Christ might have the preeminence. Okay. Verse 1. For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the most high God, who met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him. Underline blessed him. To whom also Abraham gave a tenth part. Underline tenth part of all, underline the word all. First being by interpretation king of righteousness, and after that also king of Salem, which is king of peace, without father, without mother, without descent, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made like unto, underline, but made like unto the Son of God, abideth a priest 
continually. Okay. Look at verse 4, and you want to see this. Now consider how great this man was and to whom even the patriarch Abraham gave, underline the word, the tenth of the spoils. And verily they that are of the sons of Levi who received the office of the priesthood. This is the Levitical priesthood that really today no longer exists. So I'm saying to the rabbis and all the Jews that don't accept Christ as the Messiah, when you're trying to keep the law, Jesus has fulfilled the law. You will never keep the law. The law is not designed to be kept. The law is a schoolmaster that appoints us to faith. That's what the law is, okay? And it says, who received the office of the priesthood have a commandment to take tithes. So they did take tithes. People say, I don't want to take tithes, pay tithes. Well, the Bible says take tithes. It gets your little feelings hurt. Of the people according to the law, that is their brethren, though they come out of the loins of Abraham. But he whose descent is not counted from them received tithes of Abraham. That means that Melchizedek it was not a Levitical priest. This is before the law. So this verse 6 says, But he whose descent is not counted from them received tithes of Abraham and blessed him that had the promises. Look at verse 7. And without, without all contradiction, the less is blessed of the better. Now it's getting going to get good now. Verse 8. Okay. But here, underline the word here. Where is here? Here. Here is on earth. Here, but here, but here, men that die receive tithes. Here, the Levitical priesthood, these men died. All these priests would die eventually. But there, underline there, where is there? Where is there? Somebody, you know, you got to start. I don't see two hands up, but Pastor Ulysses and Pastor Icon. Where is there? But there, he receives them of whom it is witness that he lived. Oh, there he lives. Oh, he lives. He lives. Christ Jesus lives today. He walks with me and he talks with me along life's narrow way. He lives. He lives. Are you listening to me? Salvation to impart. You ask me how. I know he lives. He lives within my heart. Come on, somebody. You have to understand. We're getting into this here. Verse 9. It says, as I may say so, Levi also who receive tithes, pay tithes. Giving in the old covenant is generational. That hasn't stopped. That Levi paid tithes through his great-grandfather before he was even born. Here, there, here, there. For he was yet in the loins of his father when Melchizedek met him. Okay. So let's keep going down a little bit. Go to verse 12. For the priesthood being changed, underline the word change, there is made of necessity a change also of the law. Now, in Hebrews 7, if you read Hebrews chapter 8 and Hebrews chapter 9, it will tell you that the law was the first covenant, but it waxed old, it's taken away. We're no longer under the law. We're under the new covenant that established on better promises. The priesthood is changed. Okay, how is the priesthood has changed? For he of whom these things are spoken pertaining to another tribe of uh, which no man gave attendance to the altar. Only the Levites gave attendance to the altar. Verse 14, for it is evident that our Lord, come on, the Lord Jesus, sprang out of Judah, the tribe of Judah, which Moses spake nothing concerning the priesthood. And it is yet far more evident for that after the similitude of Melchizedek, there arises another priest who is made not after the law of a carnal commandment, but after the power of an endless life. You have a high priest that will never die. You have a high priest who is ascended high above the heavens. You have a high priest who brought us a better hope you have a high priest, according to verse 28. By so much was Jesus made a surety of a better covenant. You have a high priest that this man, because he continued forever, has an unchangeable priesthood. 
What is the present day ministry of Jesus Christ? He is our high priest. Well, when did he become our high priest? He began the consecration on the cross. How did he begin the consecration on the cross? When that crown of thorns was on his head, and those nails were in his hand, and those nails were in his feet, and the blood from his forehead dripped to his right ear, and the blood that was on his hand dripped to the thumb on his right hand, and the blood that was on his feet dripped to the right foot toe, big toe, as the high priest of old was consecrated by the blood and with oil. Listen to me. And so the preeminence of Christ lets us know that he is our high priest today. You may not want to believe it or accept it, but where he is, go back to there. Go back to verse 8. And here, men that die, re die receive tithes. But there, he receives them. But there, he receives them. But there, he receives them. How many of you get it? How many of you get it? But there, he receives them. You give because you want to give. You give because God is worthy. You give because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. You give because you understand. What do you understand? Go to Hebrews chapter 4. No, go to Hebrews 3. Hebrews 3, 1. Hebrews 2, 17. Wherefore in all things they bestowed him to be made like unto his brethren, that he might be a what? Merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God to make reconciliation for the sins of the people. Jesus is our merciful and faithful high priest. Are you hearing me? Look at chapter 3, verse 1. Wherefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle and high priest of our profession, Christ Jesus. Did you get that, church? Did you get that? Go to Hebrews chapter 4. In Hebrews chapter 4, look at verse 14. Seeing then that we have a great high priest that has passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. For we have not a high priest, which cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Oh, what comes after that? Because Jesus has provided for us a new and living way. We have access to the holiest of all. The veil in the temple was rent. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace, that we might obtain mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. Chapter 5, verse 1. Every high priest is taken from among men, is ordained for men in things pertaining to God, that he may offer both gifts and sacrifices for sins, who can have compassion on the ignorant and on them that are out of the way. That's my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I'm telling you, he is our present-day high priest. Look at verse 5. So also... Christ glorified not himself to be made in high praise, but he that said unto him, Thou art my son, today have I begotten thee. Why don't we try Romans 8, verse 34. Let's try Romans 8, if that's not enough for you. 34, and it says this in verse 31. What shall we then say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely, freely give us all things? Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifieth. Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also lives to make intercession for us. Somebody say the preeminence of Christ. Now, one of the things that is hard to do, sometimes on a Sunday morning, when pastors are supposed to bring forth inspirational messages, 
to help you live your life and be strong in your marriage and, and, and handle your finances and govern your children and rule your household well and, and forgive and walk. But the greatest thing you'll know today, today, is that Jesus is your merciful and faithful high priest. How did he become a high priest? He could not have become a high priest on this earth while the Levitical priesthood was still operating. The Levitical priesthood had to be abolished. It was abolished. And now Jesus, who stems from the tribe of Judah, now has received an everlasting priesthood because forever and ever he lived to make intercession for you and you and you. Who can lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It's Christ that died, yea, that is risen again. And you have the accuser of the brethren who accuses us before God day and night. But we overcome him by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. I guarantee to you, saints, the crucifixion and consecration go hand in hand. I guarantee you, to you saints that under the, the law, tithing was made. You had to tithe. You had to pay the penalty. You had to. Under grace, you don't have to. But under grace, I want to. Under grace, I give because God first gave to me. Who has ever given to God first and then God owes you something? How dare these twisted games to God people into giving? Tell them how much Jesus loved them. Tell them that you can now enter into the holiest of holies. Tell them you don't have to go to a, a male, a man priest to confess your sins. Tell them that you can come boldly. Tell them that you have access to the throne. Tell them that the throne was made for them. Tell them who you are in Christ. Tell them that you have a covenant with better promises. Tell them, tell them, tell them. Then you tell me why you don't want to give. Then you tell me why you don't think it's necessary. You don't have to. But it is part of our worship. He is the one that gives us the power to get wealth that he may establish his covenant. We give because we're covenant people. We give because the covenant is re reciprocal. We give because we're children of grace. I don't care what you call it. You could call it tithing. You could call it grace giving. You could call it flower giving or flower child. But you love God. Let anybody, anybody, anybody challenge your love for God. And if you're going to churches where they are strong-arming you and twisting your arm and making you feel guilty when you got to pay your bills, making you feel guilty when you need tires, making you feel guilty rather than pay your children's school and your tuition, making you feel guilty, I guarantee you that you'll understand our inheritance, that's a whole other subject I need to teach on. But you have to understand that you are an heir of God. And if you're stingy, if you're a punk, if you don't want to give, the Holy Ghost will convict you. He will convict you. No man, no pastor, anybody, no traveling evangelist. I'm going to tell you something. They got people who will come in churches, raise offerings, already had a contract and when the offering was raised the person that raised the offering got a percentage of that offering that's why people are tired of games that's why people are tired of games if you love god lift your hands and worship him I give because I'm happy. 
I give because I'm free. His eye is on the sparrow. And I know he's watching me. I asked Jackie to sing worship songs about giving today. We don't do it enough. That's why people are so confused. I rebuke the spirit of confusion. I release clarity and revelation, the spirit of wisdom and revelation. I say to you pastors that are listening to me, if you have coerced anyone and conned anybody into giving, you get before the Lord and you ask for forgiveness. Some of you are doing just what you saw somebody else do. You saw somebody else do that. That's why you do it. Don't do that anymore. That's not the way to receive. Except the Lord build the house. They labor in vain. I have made mistakes too. I've had to stand before this congregation for things that I have said and I have done. But I never waited eight years to do it. When the Lord shows you error, you jump on that. I'm not going to let the Lord show me something and now I'm living in it and I don't tell my congregation so they can get healed till eight years later but then tell them I didn't tell you because y'all couldn't handle it. Well, 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 well. Drop the Bible. I am free from the blood of all men because I have not shunned to give unto you the full counsel of God. Now, pastors and leaders, those of you who God has made overseers of the church, that he has purchased with his own blood. Hear what he's saying. To the angels of the churches, to the keepers of my sheep, to the chosen ones who hear my voice, don't you slumber, don't you sleep, because I'll be coming soon. It's time you get the true meaning of good works and righteousness. Where were you when I was hungry? Where were you when I was sad? Where were you when I was homeless? I had no riches. All I had was rags. Did you come to see me? Did you try to feed me? If you're my people, then where, where are you? Bow your heads, please. To the angels of the church To the keepers of my sheep. chosen ones who hear my voice. Don't you slumber, don't you sleep. I'll be coming soon. It's time for you to get the truth. Try to feed me. 
Sow this word into the hearts of your people. Bind us together in the spirit of unity as the body of Christ, the church, the kingdom of God. You said a house divided against itself cannot stand, but we have received the kingdom that cannot be moved. You have made us accepted in your beloved, and you've given us grace in Christ before the world began. We give you thanksgiving and praise. Of your fullness have we all received, and grace for grace. We thank you and we praise you, Father. According to the love and the power of God that is working in our lives, the grace of God that teaches us how to give. The grace of God, Father, that shows us your power and your will by the divine leading of the Holy Spirit. And I thank you. I thank you that our hearts will be established in grace and we will give according to that understanding of kingdom building. We thank you, Father, that grace and peace is multiplied. We thank you, Father, that husbands and wives are heirs together of the grace of life. Heirs together of the grace of life. And we thank you that we'll continue to grow in grace and in knowledge and be established in the things of God. Shall we sin that grace may abound? God forbid. Father, we take your word seriously. And we take it with honor and respect and with reverence. So we'll be stewards of your manifold grace. And we will handle the word of God righteously, not deceitfully. But by manifestation of the truth, we will commend ourselves to every man's conscience in the heart of God and in the presence of God. We will not turn the grace of God into lasciviousness or fail of that. And we give you thanksgiving and we give you praise. And we honor you in Jesus' name. That we are crucified with Christ, nevertheless we live. But the life that we now live in the flesh, we live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved us and gave himself for us. We will not fail of this grace. We will not frustrate your grace. And as we abound in the gifts of the Spirit, signs, wonders, and miracles, Father, as Paul was writing to the church of Corinth regarding the church of Macedonia, we will not come short in this grace, in the grace of giving. And we give you thanksgiving and praise that we will be the men that gives into other men's bosoms. We will give to the poor. We will help the homeless. We will help the needy. We will take care of our families. We said anyone that doesn't take care of his family is worse than an infidel and has denied the faith. So by the blood of the living Christ and the cross, whose power in which we stand, I want to tell you this day, as the voice for this house, we will give God. We will honor you. We won't be like the Laodiceans that were blind and miserable and naked and didn't know because they were so rich, they thought that that equated to the kingdom of God. Jesus, you are welcome here. You will never stand outside and knock on the door because they have shut you out with their riches. And we give you the thanksgiving and praise for prosperity and grace that you take pleasure in the prosperity of your saints. It is part of biblical teaching and that tithing is a biblical principle and practice for those who choose voluntarily to participate in it. And I give you the thanksgiving and praise that none lack. In Jesus' name, amen and amen.